We look at this again. This is a very familiar uh, 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 text here. It's something that we we, we have no doubt read. Uh, we've no doubt heard. We've uh, we've heard it preached. We've heard it uh, 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 referenced uh, several times. If we've been in a church house much at all, we've heard it referenced. We've heard it mentioned. All these things. It's something that uh, uh, most of the time that I I, I remember having it referenced i've always thought it to be uh, geared more toward the lost folk but the more i've read the more i've studied the more i've attempted to have a desire and understand that it is written uh, not just to the lost folks but to the ungodliness that even christians carry with them uh, we're going to begin looking uh, at these different things but again I, I desire you to keep in mind that we are to prepare to meet our god it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And as we uh, talked this morning, as Melvin explained during his Sunday school, is, uh, uh, we've no doubt knew, knew before that uh, uh, the, the, the old law that was given, the Mosaic law, uh, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, kind of the Old Testament, if you will, all these different laws that was in there, all these right here really do is they just teach you and I that we are sinners. It teaches us that we fall short of the glory of God. It teaches teaches us that we truly uh, sin and miss the mark as that's what sin means. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It does not specify a group of people. It is not speaking to only the lost. I need you to understand that this is speaking to you and I because we have also, uh, uh, we've heard of this thing called chastisement. Uh, we've heard of uh, how God punishes those that he loves. We know that uh, uh, biblically speaking that any father will punish their children if they do wrong. So I need you to understand uh, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. You look at the different nations, you look at the different uh, 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 groups of people, nationalities, uh, biblically speaking, who have went against God, and you can see how wrath was poured out upon them. I'm going to mention Sodom and Gomorrah to you because that's what we're going to get into here just shortly, but I need you to understand that God's wrath was poured out. It was revealed unto mankind. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. This is where it gets tricky. Now, I need you to follow along because what I'm going to tell you will get confusing here in a few moments. In order for someone to be a sinner, they have to know they're a sinner. Meaning, each and every one of us was born a sinner, but you have to realize that before you're a sinner. Do you understand what it is I'm trying to tell you? It's something that's tricky, it's something that's confusing, uh, but you take Ella, you take Emery, you can take Jet, you can take Riley, you can take Lance, and you can take all these little kids. They were natural born sinners, but it's going to take them a while to know that. Just as it did you. Stay with me. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Once you realize you are a sinner, you have realized that there is a God. Now, this is something else that I want you to understand. That whether or not you have given your heart and your life to Christ, th th this part is indifferent right here. Because whether or not you have done so, if you are of a certain age and of a certain mental capacity, you now know that you are a sinner and you now know that there is a God. Whether or not you believe, that's entirely different. But you know, stay with me, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. In order for you to know that you are saved, you know that there is a God. Amen. Kind of those things is tricky. An atheist, a non-believer, a Buddhist. A Muslim, they are non-believers of our God, but they believe in something. But just because they're non-believers, let me assure you, they know there's a God. They will confess that. My Bible teaches that. In order for you to know you're a sinner, you know there's a God. I believe that according to the Bible that it teaches that God will convict our hearts. He will speak to us one time. 
And upon that moment, you have your choice whether or not you're going to make to follow Christ or you're going to choose the devil. As uh, uh, Jason, uh, we've had this conversation before about making that choice. No matter what you choose, you'll know there's a God. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for, uh, skipping down into 20, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You want to talk about the wrath of God. Whether you believe in God or not, you have seen the wrath of God. Preacher, you never seen the wrath of God. Yeah, yeah. You ever seen destruction from a flood? You see any of the pictures from a week or so ago of the tornadoes that went through uh, Clarksville? Have you seen that? You've seen wrath of God. Have you seen any kind? Have you seen the? Uh, you remember the pictures of Katrina, you, uh, uh, of Ivan, of, of the, uh, the the nor'easter that just come up in the last few days up in the northeast? Do you remember seeing any of the image from that? You have seen the wrath of God. Preacher, those are just natural disasters. Those are events. Those are just things that happen. Well. If I understand the Bible correctly, my Jesus can control the weather. Because he can speak and the wind can cease and the waves cannot rage. So if he can speak and that not happen, then I feel safe in saying that all these things that can happen can be the wrath of God. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his e eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is going to jump a long way into the future. At this point, we are making reference unto judgment. When you stand in judgment, whether you are saved or whether you are lost, friend, you have no excuse. Because as Christian people, we're going to speak to the Christians here. As Christian people, as we begin to look at these things, we have been, to, we have been taught of the judgment of God. We have taught about things that have happened uh, through, through people, through the events of the Bible, we have, uh, through all the Bible stories. Friend, these ain't just stories. These are examples for you not to learn from. But we have seen... Scripturally, the wrath of God. We have seen visually the wrath of God. I feel safe in saying with us being here on a Sunday night, we no doubt understand the wrath of God. If you are a born-again believer, you understand that God poured out his wrath on his only begotten son, so we didn't have to endure it. So you understand God's wrath. We understand if we are born again believers, his e eternal power, because if we don't believe in his eternal power, then friend, why are we here? Why waste your time coming on a Sunday night or a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night if you don't believe in an eternity? If you don't believe that you're going to spend an eternity in the presence of an almighty God, if you don't believe in the, in, that you're going to walk on streets of gold, if you don't believe these things, then friend, why are you here? Either to gain understanding of them. But I bet you believe in his eternal power. And I bet with the knowledge of just these things, we understand the next statement that we will have no excuse. When you jump into the next chapter of the book of Romans, you are going to talk, you are just going to start out, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. After reading all these things, After attending church for however many years you've attended church, when you stand in judgment and you give an account for every idle word, for your works, for all the, the, the works good and bad, for all your deeds done, for the things not done, for the fruit rendered, for the fruit that you withheld from all these things, what will be our excuse? Careless soul, why will you linger? Wandering from the fold of God is the very first line in this song it goes on to say it says uh, hear you not the invitation 
Preacher, you still right in the middle. There ain't no invitation. Hey, I'm a telling you that when God speaks, there is an invitation, and you don't have to wait on the preacher to give it because God has extended his arms and nailed them up on a cross of an, uh, an ever-ending invitation for you and I. God sending his son to die and rise and being rose from the dead upon the third and appointed day, just as the scriptures say, that is our invitation. That is a, an invitation for you and I into the eternal realm of his glory. Let's move on. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not. This is how I know he's speaking to Christians too. Because we know God. Amen. I know God. Amen. I know him. I know him on a personal level. And I also know that when there's times for me to give him glory, I do not. I know I have withheld that. I know that I have robbed my Savior and my God of glory upon several different, different occasions. And I also know that I have no excuse. And I also know that I will give an account for that. I have no excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. You know what the funny thing about God is? He's God all the time. Amen. He don't take a day off and he don't take a nap. He don't take a smoke break. He don't need a coffee run. God's there. The line don't ever get busy. You ain't got to worry about whether or not the internet's out. God's God each and every day. God's God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. God has been God since it, our Bible says in the beginning. Amen. And if you read and understand your Bible correctly, he was God long before that. But when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. Christian people, how often are you not thankful? Have you taken five minutes to thank God today for the opportunity to get up, to eat, to suck wind, to drink? Did you thank God for the opportunity to see your kids? Did you thank him for the opportunity to hug your kids? Did you thank God for the opportunity for getting to come into his house and to, hear, uh, and to have the opportunity to sing praises unto him? Have you really took five minutes to thank God? This is how I know that the book of Romans here is speaking to the slave people too because we don't take that opportunity. Not always. But it says, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, you can go without thanking God long enough that it don't even cross your mind anymore. You can go so long without giving God the glory that it really don't really uh, register that you might ought to do so anymore. You know, verse 22 correlates very directly with this morning. Some of us really think we're smart. Julie was helping Abby do extra credit this evening when we was talking about Benjamin Franklin. <clears throat> I felt rather intelligent because I was telling her, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, uh, people say Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity. Well, he, he's, he didn't. He discovered that lightning will shock the fart out of you. I mean, let's just be blunt about it. I mean, that's kind of what it was. But we was talking about all these things, and I kind of felt smart. I kind of felt wise for a minute because Julie's like, why would you even care to know that? Well, I mean, these things, history just fascinates me, and I really like to know as much as I can know about it. But anyhow, professing themselves to be wise, some of us think ourselves to be wise in all sorts of things, whether it be history whether it be cooking, uh, whether it be cars, whether it be farming, whether it be biblically speaking, 
uh, whether it be uh, just upon just, you know, random things in life. Well, you ought to do this. You ought to do that. Hey, you ought to talk to so-and-so. He really knows what he's talking about there. Best advice anybody can give anybody was don't you pray about it. That's good advice. That's good sound advice right there. That's what the Bible taught us to do this morning. Now, why don't you pray about it? And I'll pray about it, and then we'll talk about it again. But anyhow, let's move ahead. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Preacher, I've never done that. Never said that you did. But there were churches. There are churches that I know that at one point in my childhood were founded upon biblical facts that now are not. They have changed an image of something that is timeless, something that is uncorruptible, something that cannot be changed. And they've changed it. And they've made it into what they needed. They've uh, modernized the Bible. So what it is, they modernized it, and they've uh, 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 because the the Bible was too sexist. You know, it, uh, uh, it it restricted women's rights, and we're now in the uh, we're in a new millennium. We're in the two thousands, and uh, women have a right to be preachers. Women have a right to be deacons. I don't mean to hurt any of you ladies' feelings, but the way I understand the Bible, you do not. I'm sorry. But they have changed these things. You have, so we have changed it. Uh, it um, I might actually have a dollar. I doubt it. I'm kind of broke usually. Nope, that's a dollar store receipt. You stay with me. Oh, I found some. If you read your dollar bill, right above the one... This is United States currency, and it says, in God we trust. What a bunch of malarkey. We have changed the image of God into just a, a, a phrase. In God we trust. You drive around the courthouse square on all four sides of it, you will see the in gold letters, in God we trust. On um, the patrol cars, I think in Pickett County, they might have put them on in Overton County, but I don't think they did because they had too much backlash. You will see in black stickered letters, In God We Trust. How many of these county officials, how many uh, does our governor, does our, uh, uh, do our, our, our United States senators and, and congressmen and all these folks, do they really trust in God? Have they created just an image of something? We trust in something, but if it's God, they would glorify God. Stay with me. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. We have begun to give glory to almost anything and everything under the sun other than God. I seen a picture, it's a little, uh, one of the little internet picture caption deal, whatever you call them things today, and it had a picture of a kid in a school uh, uh, reading a, a philosophy book or something like that, and there was a picture of a man wearing a jumpsuit in prison reading the Bible. And it said people in prison are encouraged to read the Bible, people in schools are discouraged from even bringing a Bible. And it said if people, if they would reverse these roles, I bet you could empty out one. Meaning if people read the Bibles in school, they may not be as many people in the prisons. Understand that that's what it said. But understand also that in this nation, you know, in God we trust. Do you? I'm asking specifically. From the message this morning to where we are at tonight, do we? Verse 2 in our song says, Why so thoughtless are you standing? Why so thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by? 
It ain't something that just happened last week, church. It's not something that you have just a new habit that we as Christian people have just began. It is a habit that's been created over the course of our lifetime. Just as we quit uh, uh, up here, it says, uh, while well, they glorified him not as God, they, uh, other things. It's not something that you just started doing. It's something that became a habit of you doing. You didn't just wake up one morning and think, I'm no longer going to thank God. You just woke up one day and you forgot to thank Him. And you know what? You didn't really think about it much the next day and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you're in a, you're in a habit of not thanking God. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things and any other idol that you can think of. Because sometimes when we, you know, we've even changed the way we tell our story. Instead of saying, thank God, you know what we say now? Thank goodness. No, I mean, do we not? We say it. Other people say it. We've just taken God out of our stories entirely. Well, thank goodness they was there. Thank goodness this happened. Thank goodness I had trip away. Thank goodness I bought the expensive tires. No, thank God that he was watching over you. Do not change the image of an uncorruptible from an almighty God into the image of something else. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. We'll go to there for just a moment. You know, I told you that the, the, the neat thing about God is he's God all the time. Let me tell you something else that's pretty neat. His word's true all the time. You're not going to find a lie in this book that God says. Now, you'll find some lies that the devil says. You'll find lies that men say, but you'll not find the true words of God being a lie. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. The truth of God will never leave us nor forsake us. But sometimes we will claim that these things happen because we've been forsaken. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator. It's tricky right here because we can look for this from a multitude of different angles and for the sake of time we'll just make mention to them. Studies on Wednesday night we understand that Satan was created by God. He was an angel. He was referred to in the Bible a few different times as a creature. Stay with me. Worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. The creator, at all, it, it, for, for all intents and purposes, the creator is God. That's who the creator is made mention to. That's who it's referring to, is being the almighty God. The, 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 the creature can be anything else that God created that we worship. Again, just being an idol. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature. You can get into homosexuality. You can talk about uh, how, you know, a girl wakes up one day and decides they don't feel like a girl, they want to be a man. Uh, changing their, their gender, if you want to get very specific within the Bible, that is uh, uh, wrong. Um... My Bible teaches that God is all-knowing, all-powerful. My Bible teaches me that God don't lie. My Bible teaches me that God has a plan for you and I. And if God planned on you being a girl, you would have been born a girl. My Bible teaches if God planned on you being a boy, you would have been born a boy. My Bible also kind of teaches that if uh, our helpmates that we have, our, our, our life partners, if they had been meant to be a woman and a woman and a man and a man, God wouldn't have made Eve. He would have just made another man. But God gave them up to vile affections for even their women did change their national... Wait, is this still saying God we trust? No, what, wait, what does America teach us?
If they have rights to, they do have the right. They have the right to make their own decision. They have the right to make their own mind. They have the right, just as you and I did, to choose heaven and hell. But, hear you not the earnest pleadings of your friends that wish you will. But that next line right there says, or perhaps maybe before you have the opportunity that you'll be called to meet your God. Because the name of the song is prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? Have you, I understand that we may have made preparations for eternity. But friend, are you prepared to meet God? Kind of has more relevance here. Um, as the current situation that we are faced with, we're kind of faced with a more uh, 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 needing to, to uh, have a preparedness about us for uh, uh, maybe not us, but a, a loved one uh, being prepared to, to, to do these very things. But as we talk this evening, he's prepared. You know, Paul ain't been in church in a long time, but he, he ain't no less smart, biblically speaking. He, uh, just as Paul has done a few times, he has had to put me in my place. And he has had to show, well, no, no it's this. And, uh, but we, we, had, we got to have a, a good conversation. But perhaps before tomorrow you'll be called to meet your God. And even as they did not like to retain in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now we're going to look at this in two different ways. So we've made mention before that each and every lost person will have an opportunity to accept Christ. I believe that, and I believe that that is scriptural. I believe that God is obligated to knock on your heart's door one time. You may only get it once. You may be one of the lucky ones who got it for 40 years. Either way, at some point, God will just give you over to do the things that we do, even as Christian people who do not like to retain God in their knowledge. You know, there's born-again believers that God speaks to over and over and over and over. Now, we have this, there's an ongoing debate amongst several people. That whether or not that person's even saved. But we'll not have that bait tonight. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. There's biblical churches that are full of those things. Sure enough. There are churches that condone the fornication, the wickedness, the unrighteousness. There are churches that condone adultery. There are churches that condone, condone adultery. There are churches that uh, uh, are, are all that, that are okay with uh, just uh, inviting the, the the proverbial world, not the people of the world, but the the, the aspects of the world right into the church. There are churches that are full of backbiters. The haters of God. Preacher, I disagree with you there. I don't think that the church would be full of anybody that hates God. Well, if the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light and he can have his workers in the same manner, if he can have false teachers within the church house, I feel safe in saying that churches can be filled full of people that hate God. Biblically speaking, scripturally speaking, if you love God, you keep his commandments.
without understanding. I'll tell you something Paul Hall taught me a long time ago. If you desire to understand the word of God, you'll understand it. And if you don't, you won't. He told me once if I desired to learn how to cook, I could learn how to cook. If I didn't want to learn how to cook, I wouldn't. It's kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, all of our parents have told us, grandparents have told us, you can do whatever you set your mind to do. I've said that to my kids. I've been told that. Heard it upon multiple different occasions. I've said it to a few of these little fellers that are here. If you desire to have an understanding of God and you desire to have an understanding of the Word of God, friend, you can. And if you don't, you won't. But who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things. It's funny because you have false doctrine churches. You have false teachers. You have, you, you have true God-fearing people that sits within those churches. They preach about, sometimes they preach about heaven and hell and judgment and, and, and the wrath of God and these different things. And they hear these things, but it never clicks. It never sinks in. The Bible says that the wages of sin are de is death. Amen? Amen? And how can we that know that and understand that? Because if we are born again believers, we understand that the wages of sin is death. How, that w how are we that can know and understand that? How can uh, the Bible even uh, ask you later in this very same book, how can we live in sin any longer? How can we continue to do it? If you know the consequences, if you know uh, what is going to happen, if you know all these things, how can we stand to continue in sin? They that commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasures in them that do them. If you spurn the invitation till the Spirit shall depart... If you spurn the invitation until you have become Ichabod, till the spirit and the glory of the Lord has passed. We can stand white knuckled on a pew. No doubt if you've been in church long enough, you have seen conviction upon someone. You know what it looks like. You have watched them tremble. You've watched them shake. And you've watched them walk right out the back door. No doubt at some point you have stood in your pew. You've sat in your pew. You have heard God speak into your heart. You have felt it. You have felt conviction. You have felt the desire. Maybe it's not conviction. Maybe you've just felt the desire to pray for someone, for someone else, a, a, an issue, whatever it may be. You have felt these things and you've neglected to do so. All these are one and the same. If you spurn the invitation till the Spirit shall depart. Then you'll see your sad condition. You know, if we truly lived each day like it was our last. You know, I've told you guys before that uh, I, I, I'm strange, I'm weird. Uh, I would want to know that I was going to die. You call me crazy, cancer wouldn't be a horrible thing for me because I would know. Sounds stupid, right? You are looking at me like, who in the world would want that? Well, I might not like hearing the words. Somebody says you got three to six months, three to six weeks, whatever it is, but I would know. I would know that there's a time frame that I need to make amends for everything that I've done, that there's a time that I truly need to be prepared with the people around me spiritually. Uh, I, I, there was a, I would know. Well, my Bible teaches us that we do not. But then you'll see your sad condition unprepared to meet our God. 
the latter part that it says, Oh, how sad to face the judgment. Whether you're at the judgment seat of Christ or whether you're at the great white throne judgment, friend, you'll face judgment. Why would we want to face that in any way other than prepared? Now, it's like this. I don't know your heart this evening. I don't know what's going on in your life. I can only speak for mine. But why would we take the chance and leaving this place not prepared? 